Nearly every week on Chairside Live, we give away a reverse preparation kit. And uh, somebody wrote in and said, would you please explain what it does? And I thought, well, this is a good opportunity to get the chance to do just that. So I wanted to show you the burrs on the kit first before we get into the technique. The first one's a simple um, uh, 57, it could be a 56, 55. The only thing we don't want to use is a cross cut, you know, the 556 and 557 because of the fact that they cause a lot of uh, damage, a lot of shattering of the enamel around the area while we're working and beyond it, even into the dentin as well. This, uh, the, one of the quick early burrs you're gonna see us use is this 801021 burr. Um, this is a burr that you may have used for operative or some sort of round diamond, not typically a crown and bridge burr, uh, but you're gonna see how we use this very early in the technique to prepare the gingival margin. The next thing we have are the depth cutters, and I got into these very early because when I first started working here, I was still under preparing teeth and uh, the technicians just <laughs> would not stand for that. And so we have three depth cutters here. The first one is a 0.6 millimeter depth cutter. So there's one, you see that one ring on there and it's a 006 on the burr kit. So that's a 0.6 millimeter depth cutter. That's the minimal thickness for Bruxer. So if I'm doing a Bruxer crown on a lower second molar, I'll use this burr uh, to put a depth cut on both lingual cusps and then two in the central groove, maybe even the buckle cusp too, because on a second molar that can be difficult to see. And then I'll prep the occlusal surface till I can't see those depth cuts anymore. And then I know I have at least six tenths of a millimeter of reduction, probably seven tenths by that point. Um, and so I've got enough for a Bruxer crown, but if I still need to adjust the bite, I'm gonna have to do it on the opposing tooth. We don't want Bruxer to get any thinner than that, but that's amazing. That's a very short cutting surface, very conservative restoration when you can do it at six tenths of a millimeter. This is a 1.5 millimeter depth cut. This is what we use for uh, any bilayered material like lava, Procera, Zirconia, PFMs, and I even use it for Emacs um, because I like to be able to have an adequate thickness. The minimal thickness for Emacs is one millimeter and I feel more comfortable with it at 1.5 millimeters because it does have more strength at that point than it does at one millimeter. So it's a depth cutter and again, because of the shape of this, you sink it right down to that little shoulder and it stops. So you can't go too deep with these depth cutters. They're self-limiting in nature. And here's the two millimeter depth cutter. It's got four rings on it. One, two, three, four. And two millimeters is what uh, pretty much every dental manufacturer has been asking for in terms of occlusal reduction for a PFM for the last uh, 40 years. Um, you can get away with 1.5 uh, on PFMs or on Emacs, but for those cases where you wanna make sure you've got the material um, at its maximum strength, uh, two millimeters uh, does really good. Three millimeters, um, a lot of materials, including traditional ceramics, actually get weaker. So two millimeters is where a lot of these materials, especially the feldspathic ceramics, reach their maximum strength. As you'll see in the technique, this 856025 burr is gonna be the workhorse of the technique. It's gonna do most of the tooth removal. Once we put the depth cuts in, we're gonna connect everything with this. You can see it's a super course. You can see where it says SC on the burr kit and the black stripe there. And you can see how big those particles are uh, of diamonds on the burr. And so it's gonna remove tooth structure rather quickly. As a result, we're not gonna get a lot of buildup of heat on the tooth, but obviously we still use it with water. So even though it's very coarse and removes tooth structure very quickly, because of the depth cuts, we're able to use this um, in a manner to uh, very quickly prep the tooth because we know exactly where we're going with the depth cuts. And then uh, the other burr next to it, the 856016, is the same burr, same shape, same grit, uh, just a thinner burr. So the one on the left, the 016, uh, the skinnier burr is the one that we use interproximally so we don't bump the adjacent tooth when there's not room to go in with the 025 yet. So it just kind of depends on the teeth and the contours of the teeth. But oftentimes I'll go in like on anterior teeth with the 016 first. And once I've gone through there uh, once or twice in approximately with this bird, then I'm able to use the big one, which has the, uh, the shape that I like at the tip and really gives us a nice uh, finish line. They're both the same shape at the tip. One's just a little deeper uh, than the other one. So this one would be good for Bruxer, for example, and for Emacs, I would go with you know the 025 on the right just to give us a little more. And then for lingual reduction on anterior teeth, or you could even use this on posterior teeth for occlusal reduction. There's our Supercars 379023 football burr, and of course, because of its uh, convex shape, it's gonna give us a concave 
uh, depth cut or reduction on the lingual of those anterior teeth. And that's it. There's a couple other burrs that I use that I just want to bring in. Um, these two burrs I started using when I started taking digital impressions. And these are the same as our other two burrs. These are the uh, 856 burrs, an 025 and an 016, but this is in a fine grit. So you can tell by the red stripe and just looking at the particles here compared to the super coarse ones, that these are much smoother. So when I used to only use the super coarse burrs over here to finish my margin, when I would take a digital impression and it would show me uh, the prep on the screen, I could see all the little chips out of the margin. And I realized that when using magnification, my technician was gonna have a question about what to include uh, in the restoration and what to ignore. So now I go over it with these fine grit burrs at the very end and smooth off that margin. And now I don't have any huge chips out of the margin, even when I take a digital impression, which blows up the prep 30 times uh, on, the, uh, on the computer screen. And the last one that I use sometimes is a 392-016. We just kind of call this a mosquito burr. Uh, the proper name's a 392-016 burr. And this is when you're prepping teeth um, and it typically happens in the posterior and you've placed your margin, but there's still not enough separation uh, between the tooth you're working on and the one next to it. You can barely get retraction cord, if at all. And that's why I'll go in with this and kind of recontour with this fine grit burr, burr in between and create some separation between those two teeth because we're gonna be able to need to get a saw blade in there, obviously, to be able to section that die out of there. So anytime you have two teeth contacting each other in the gingival third um, because of the way of root proximity or whatever it might be, this 392-016 does a great job of separating those two teeth. So let's take a look at what this looks like clinically. This is a good clinical case to demonstrate the reverse preparation technique on because it's a single anterior tooth that doesn't have a lot of previous restorations before. We, so we can stay true uh, to the way the prep technique is meant to be done. It's also an interesting case because tooth number seven is an all ceramic crown, albeit not a great one. Tooth number eight's a natural tooth, AKA God's crown, looking pretty nice. Tooth number nine's also a natural tooth, but it's had endodontic treatment. That's the one we're gonna be working on. It's got some recurrent decay. Uh, around a composite that's there and we need to get that tooth to match tooth number eight if we can. And then teeth number uh, nine and 10 are a splinted PFM. Uh, so this is actually gonna be the first Bruxer anterior crown that I did from uh, eh, about a year and a half ago. And it'll be interesting to see how it blends in with the rest of the teeth. So step one of the reverse preparation technique is to break the contact. So again, we're gonna take uh, a 56 carbide, 57, anything that's not cross cut, and we're gonna use it on the mesial and distal to break those contacts. And the reason we're doing this first is because this next step, we wanna go ahead and get a double zero cord into place. And so we're gonna place this double zero cord. I'm gonna floss it into place. And what I mean by that is use it just like dental floss. I'm gonna just take it and place it on the uh, mesial and the distal of this tooth, and then pull the two loose ends towards the lingual so that the facial portion of the cord gets close to the tooth. And once it does that, I'll use my uh, cord packing device, a non-serrated device to get this ultra pack double zero cord from UltraDent, a hollow braided cord down into place. And then on the lingual, we're gonna cut the two ends so they sit flush to each other. I don't want them to overlap at all because we're gonna place another cord into the sulcus by the time we're all done. So step three is gonna be preparation of the gingival margin. And that's why this is called the reverse preparation technique because in dental school, I was taught to prep the gingival margin last. And here we're gonna do it first. This is that 801021 round diamond. And you can see that I'm using it, trying to keep the shank parallel to the long axis of the tooth. And basically just prepping until half of that round diamond is into the tooth. And that half circle that I'm prepping into the tooth is gonna to do two things. It's gonna make sure that we have enough reduction in that area, in the gingival third, to have an aesthetic restoration. And at the same time, it's gonna be the beginning of our margin formation, almost the end of it. Because that half circle, when we do the rest of our axial reduction, that half circle will turn into a quarter circle. And that quarter circle is the perfect deep chamfer. This is the easiest margin you will ever prep on a crown. And the nicest margin you'll probably ever prep on a crown if your hands are anything like mine. Using this round diamond is the key to this technique, at least to getting the margin correct and getting it uniform on the facial and the lingual. So this round burr is, is really a great find. It was something that I found being used back in an old 1940s prosthodontic textbook, if you can believe that. The next step in this technique is the incisal edge uh, depth cut. And even though this is gonna be a Bruxer crown, um, I'm prepping it as, as a universal preparation, as though this were gonna be Emacs. So I'm doing a two millimeter depth cut. 
in the incisal edge. I said earlier depth cuts uh, about Emacs can be at 1.5 millimeters, but if we're going to cut back and layer it like most dentists like on anterior teeth, two millimeters is fantastic to give your technician plenty of room to give you a great looking Emax crown. So after we put those two depth cuts in there, the next thing we're gonna do is go to, with an axial depth cut. And this is gonna be a 1.5 millimeter depth cut that we're gonna place just below the junction of the incisal third and the middle third. We don't wanna go too far towards the incisal because we'll lose it when we do our incisal reduction. And we don't need to go down towards the gingival because we already have a depth cut with our round burr there. And you can see how I just push it into the tooth like that and it bottoms out and it won't go too deep. And so now we have our depth cuts. We've got two millimeters at the incisal edge. We've got a 1.5 millimeter axial depth cut. And then we have one millimeter uh, of reduction that's been done in the gingival third. And our margin's essentially in the right place because we've already retracted the tissue vertically by placing that double zero cord in place. And we're also gonna use that round burr on the lingual for the margin formation uh, there as well. Once we've done all that, we're ready to blend the depth cuts, and now it's just a matter of uh, drilling till we don't see uh, any holes anymore. So we're gonna use that 856-025 burr that I said was kind of the workhorse of this technique, and just start on the facial surface by blending these uh, depth cuts together. And because of the position of the depth cuts and the depth of them, it kind of forces the preparation to end up being the right shape to be properly reduced and to have a nice margin. And so because I've always admitted that I have a very average set of hands, this acted like a road map or a GPS for me. And, and simply by going by the depth cuts and doing all the reduction around the depth cuts, I've ended up with really nice preps with good margins on it, but not because of any increase in skill in my hands. It's just kind of following this cookbook technique. As we head in approximately, I mentioned we're going to use the smaller burr. This is the 856-016 burr. And the 025 wouldn't quite fit in there right now without hitting the adjacent teeth. In fact, anytime you see an anterior preparation like this that's over tapered on the mesial and distal, it's a pretty good sign uh, that the dentist who prepped it went in with too large of a burr and had to over uh, lean the burr towards the inside of the tooth and uh, over prepped it trying to avoid the tooth next to it. And that can be avoided with this 856-016 burr because it'll fit between any two sets of teeth. Prior to using digital impressions, this is how I finished off the prep. I would take my electric hand piece turn the speed all the way down from 40,000 RPMs down to 2,000 RPMs and turn the water off because the burr is spinning so slowly. And then with a the light touch, use my 856-025 burr to really go in and kind of blend all the planes together and smooth the margin. You can see that with the water off, you can really tell what you're doing because it leaves a nice little line of powder right next to what you're doing. And it's not obscured with water because we're running this burr at such a slow speed and using kind of light pressure strokes so that we're not overheating the tooth. Obviously, this is an endo tooth, but I use this same technique on all vital teeth um, as well. And so it, it was really nice to be able to go in and do this. Then once I started taking digital impressions, you know, I realized, wow, I'm leaving these chunks out of the margin. I better use something to refine that and smooth that a little bit better so my technician's not confused about what we're doing. Lastly, we're going to go in, well, we've added one more step because of digital impressions, but uh, we're going to go in with the 379023 football burr, and we're going to prep the lingual. Um, you can place a depth cut here if you'd like, a one millimeter depth cut for um, Emacs on the lingual, or you can place a 0.6 millimeter depth cut if you're doing Bruxer, or for most dentists on an anterior tooth like this because the patient can bite together and you can actually see the incisal edge of the lower anterior tooth and where it approximates the upper tooth, it's not necessary for that depth cut. Then we're going to place our top cord of the two cord technique. This is a size two cord, ultra pack cord from Ultranet, and that's being placed on top of that. You really can't floss this one into place because it might disturb the double zero cord uh, below it. If you tried to kind of floss it in, you'd move that cord around. So typically I'll just tuck in one end inner proximally as an anchor and then start there and work my way around. Again, this cord looks large, but it, you gotta keep in mind that it's hollow. So as you press it down and pack it in, it collapses into the sulcus and then it kind of sits and regains its shape once it's in uh, the sulcus again. So uh, I mentioned with the first cord, we wanna have the two ends flush and we cut it that way with the scissor. Here we can have a little extra overlap or a little piece hanging out because we're going to pull uh, this cord out um, after eight to ten minutes and we want a little tag to be able to grab onto. So we'll cut it and leave a little tag there. Now you might notice that with that top cord in, 
on the facial um, that we get a little extra vertical retraction. Most of the retraction comes from that first cord that goes in, but here we have a little extra, and this is something I really only do on endo teeth, and that is drop the margin down just a little bit more, still keeping it super gingival, uh, because the cord's in. Once the cord's gone, it'll be slightly subgingival. But this is that 856025 fine grit burr being used here to smooth out any of the chips that are in the margin from the super coarse burr. And so again, only on an endo tooth would I drop down the margin a little bit more at this last step, just because I don't want to see the junction between the prep uh, and the crown itself, because I know the prep's going to be much uh, darker. So again, turning the RPMs on the electric handpiece down to 2,000 RPMs, turning off the water, and you have to be even more careful with this fine grip burr, because it doesn't remove a lot of tooth structure, it actually creates more frictional heat on the surface of the tooth. So with the water off and the handpiece turned down, there's actually more chance of heating up the tooth with the fine grit burr than the super coarse grit burr. And here's an incisal look at what it looks like when we smooth it all off and both cords are in place. And now what we're going to do is place a uh, anatomic copper cap. You can see it's anatomic because of the cutouts on the side because we don't want to blunt the papilla. And my assistant has moistened this. Again, with an endodontic tooth, we don't need to moisten it, but just pretending this is a vital tooth, we would moisten this because we want to keep that prep uh, nice and wet. We don't want to over dry it. Eight to ten minutes later, my phone vibrates in my pocket and I know it's time to take an impression. And so we're going to pull that number two cord out. There's my assistant pulling it out. You can see already we've got a great wide open sulcus. As I squirt that wash material, you can see it move forward in the sulcus uh, ahead of where I'm actually squirting it. And that's the benefit of this two cord technique. By having the bottom cord still in place during this impression, we have no bleeding uh, because we still have that cord in contact with the inflamed base of the sulcus. And also by having that top cord, we get a lot of lateral retraction of the tissue that we don't get in a one cord technique. And that lateral retraction gives us a wide open sulcus. And this would almost be an impossible impression to miss. So I go around six or seven times. That's probably a few too many times. But uh, going around enough times and my assistant fills the tray. Another assistant, a second assistant fills the tray, hands it to me, place it in the mouth. Patient bites down for four minutes, impression comes out. We see a nice ring of impression material beyond the margin. And that's really what we want to see. That's the key is that bit of impression material beyond the margin because that allows our technicians to positively identify where the margin ends. So that's the end of the prep technique, but we'll watch this crown be set just uh, uh, because I know you're probably wondering how the case turned out. And again, this is my first Bruxer crown. Really shocking at the time for me to look at it and see that there was no ceramic material on this crown at all. That's just 100% zirconia oxide, no veneering ceramic and uh, it doesn't look as good as the natural tooth next to it but when you compare it to you know the pfm and when you compare it to uh the all the uh all ceramic crown on the other side neither of those are really well done i'll give you that and it doesn't look as good as god's crown the natural tooth on tooth number eight but from this very first one i put in and this is with my technician my in-house technician helping with some custom staining uh, it matches pretty well it's not bad for something that's a chunk of zirconia with no weak porcelain to break off of it that said if i was out in private practice and doing a single crown like this without an in-office technician i would do an emax crown there uh, no questions asked it's just going to be easier to get that to blend in but we started noticing doctors prescribing anterior bruxer and i thought you know what i better do some of these and see uh, how it works. It, it works certainly very well, especially when you have an in-house technician. So that's a quick look at the reverse preparation technique. If you want to see uh, the full version of it with some expanded sections and that case from start to finish, uh, check it out at glidewelldental.com.